Uh, well, welcome to a uh, U City, the church. I am Pastor T, um, and this is uh, Rory. Say hey, Rory. Okay. She doesn't want to say hey back, so I'm sorry. Um, no, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, uh, you are at a church, a multi-ethnic church, where we meet God in new ways, love people where they are, and we follow Jesus. What? Boldly. And we follow Jesus boldly. And we are so thankful that you are here. If this is your first time, if you see a face that you don't recognize, turn to them and clap for them. Clap in their face. Clap in their face. Um, and show them that we are thankful for them being here. If, if this is your first, second, third time here, we hope that uh, you feel looked upon um, and not overlooked, that uh, you were said hi to, and that uh, you uh, were greeted. We are a church where, uh, where we um, hope that each and every one of us are looked upon and not overlooked. Uh, one of our values here is that vulnerability saves and that is being your unpolished and unprocessed self in real time jesus wants that why should we want something else from each and every one of you so we are so thankful you are here this is our third week in in our new space god is good right right rory okay great um um we are so thankful uh, uh, for this space, um, just uh, this is kind of like our preseason. This is kind of like our preseason on September eighth. We are inviting the whole neighborhood and the surrounding neighborhoods, um, and and we hope that you are inviting people as well. It is our like grand opening here. Come and see. Come and meet us. We are proud of uh, uh, U City. Uh, we believe that we have work here to do. Um, uh, before we move any further, I want to um, introduce someone to you. Uh, this is a mentor of mine, and I am so excited um, he is here. His name is Pastor Rufus, and he won't do this, and so I will brag on him for a second. He is actually bringing our message. Um, and one of the things I love about him is that every time I pick him up from the hotel or something and we grab dinner or lunch or breakfast I like ask him how are you doing and he says I'm content that's his word I'm content and you will actually feel that radiate off of him he is a man of great wisdom um, he is a a man that has uh, done some incredible things he is um, he is from Memphis Tennessee he pastors um, Hope Church he he um, is one of the justice leaders of that a, a, a community. One, one of the things that I love that he did is he uh, uh, took over a, a church of 8,000 people that was 99%, let's say, Anglo or white, and, and, and he felt um, a push from God uh, 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 to make it multi-ethnic church and um and and i will say this as well not that numbers matters but i think that this is an, an incredible that he he pastors the largest presbyterian church in america and 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 he will not tell you that he is so humble um one of the other things that i love about him is is that he started a school he started a school for the a, a, a community, an entire school. So, uh, give it up for that. Give it up for that. And another thing that I love about him is that he also uh, started a resource center for the uh, 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 community uh, that he, he serves in. And so, uh, Pastor Rufus, if you were uh, come on up as Pastor Rufus is coming up. Give him the biggest U City welcome. Thank you so much.
Let's bow for a moment of silent prayer and break the silence. In the stillness of this moment, in the quietness of this hour, we pause, our Father, to capture your presence. And to thank you afresh for the total sufficiency of Jesus Christ, the supply of your Holy Spirit, and fellowship with other Jesus followers. We ask that you would save us from being unduly distracted by the daily details of life. For the time that we're gathered, may we center our focus on Jesus Christ, the life giver King. Sit us all down under the authority of your word that we came to hear you speak, not men's opinions. In the strong and perfect name of Jesus Christ, do we pray and praise you. Amen. The word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces asunder between the joints and the marrow the soul and the spirit, and is a critic of the thought and the intent of the heart. Peter says that all scripture is God-breathed, and as such it is profitable for reproof, rebuke, correction, and instruction in righteousness. The psalmist in Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight, her delight, is in the law of the Lord. It's in that law does he meditate, she meditate, meditate day and night. And as a result, he or she will be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. Leaves will not wither. Fruit will come in due season, and whatsoever he or she does shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff that the wind drives away. <clears throat> I am delighted to be here today and want to call your attention to our text for the day, uh, Matthew chapter 9 verses 35 through 38. I don't know if you can see it. Um, can you see it? Yes. Great. So you can read it with me? Yes? yes. Okay. I can hardly see you. So uh, the only way I know you out there is if you say amen. 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 If you notice, I'm a black preacher. And um, saying amen to a black preacher is like saying sick him to a dog. <laughs> so if I'm going to finish in less than an hour, I think Pastor T gave me, then you got to let me know you out there by saying, amen. If, if you hear something true, or if you don't like to say amen, you can say hear, hear. That's fine. Just say something. Um, Matthew 9, we're going to read it together in unison, but we're going to pause at every comma, colon, and park at every period so that we can read it in unity. All right. And let's read it with some vim, vigor, and vitality. Amen? Amen. This is, after all, the word of God. Would you stand with me? <clears throat> And we are reading. Jesus continued.
Amen. You may be seated. So here is the sermon in a sentence. I didn't say the sermon would be a sentence. I said here is the sermon in a sentence. Jesus did not see his city as too hard or the people as hellions, but rather a harvest. He did not see the city as too hard, nor did he see the people as hellions, but a harvest. So I want to focus on how, how does Jesus see Charlotte? or any city? And then how does he want us to see that city? Uh, before I start, I'd like to give commendation to Pastor T and for the God man that he is. And uh, the time I've gotten to know him over the last couple of years, uh, I have appreciated his, his boldness. Let's appreciatively applaud the Lord for Pastor T. Amen. And then his compadre, uh, Pastor Maria, I saw her earlier. Is she in the house? There she is. All right. Let's praise God for her. Am I doing something wrong? No? All right. Good. I have to tell you, uh, as I walked in, um, this place reminds me of my first church in Houston, Texas. I lived in Houston all of my life until the last 14 years in Memphis, Tennessee. And this church uh, reminds me so vividly of the church in Houston. We called it the City of Refuge. It was an evangelical Presbyterian church and while Pastor T talked about where I am now at Hope Presbyterian, uh, I don't want to focus on that one. I want to focus on where I started. And I started right here. I saw people putting up chairs and setting up classrooms. And uh, it brought a little tear to my eye because it caused me to reminisce about where God started my pastoral journey city of refuge in Houston, Texas. We were about 39 people, um, and most of them were occasion except two. Uh, but we had a desire to want to reflect the city, uh, the one three five mile radius that we were located in. Uh, and um, so we started. Uh, we gave it um, everything we had, trying to give the glory to God. And after 12 years, that church uh, grew. Uh, and uh, as Pastor T said, we started a school for pre-K three through eighth grade for uh, under-resourced kids. We started a community development center uh, as well by the time I left. Um, and um, it was 40,000 square feet. God allowed us to raise about six and a half million dollars. So we were debt free, uh, build a small church as well. Uh, the school met there and outgrew it and we had to go and buy a real school like this. Um, and then I was called away to Memphis, Tennessee. But let me encourage you, let me encourage you. Fruit will come in due season. It, it may not come when you want. How many of you like to get fruit when you plant it? Just the day you plant it. I, do, I would. But no, it comes in due season. Please be encouraged that what you are doing for the sake of the gospel and the kingdom will have its fruit. And you are the planters. You are the pioneers. And God will use you in order to bring the gospel to this community. Please understand that. I can remember when we were just like this. I knew every face and name and 
uh, baby in the crowd. And when they missed, I knew that too. It was just a wonderful beginning. And um, we gave it everything we had in his name. And God, by his grace, he doesn't have to, but by his grace, he blessed our little work. And the great experiment that we started in 1998 became the grand experience. And I am praying that that will be the same for you. So don't you dare be discouraged. Be not weary in well-doing, but in due season. You will reap if you faint not. As my grandmama said, I know what I'm talking about now. And uh, please hear me. I used to say, well, mama, I have some. She said, no, boy, I know what I'm talking about. I said, yeah, mom, but you haven't lived the life I lived. She said, I know what I know, and I know what I'm talking about. And uh, she convinced me that she did know what she was talking about because she had been where I was, but I hadn't been where she was. So please, don't be weary in well-doing. I want you to appreciatively applaud the Lord for where he's going to take you should you remain faithful. Can you do that? Amen. Yeah, I almost feel like starting over again. But let me get to my, let me get to my text. Um, as we look at this particular passage, there are several things that I want to say that we look and see what Jesus did. If we just follow his blueprint, uh, then he will lead us to where he wants to lead us. The first thing we see in this passage is that Jesus was going, he was going from city to city and village to village. He was pedestrian. So the first thing that I want to say in terms of making a point is he went. He went. Jesus went. He didn't wait for people to come, but he went to them. He went. Most of the rabbis of the day uh, sort of clustered in Jerusalem and at the temple. But Jesus was pedestrian, and he was out proximate to the people, proximate to their pain, and there he was out among the people. He, he went. In fact, when we get to Matthew 9.35, Jesus has already had seven encounters with various people all outside of the temple, seven encounters, three of them with people of means, or in his day, people who were wealthy, and four of them, people who had meager means. So Jesus was comfortable in both socioeconomic worlds. He was in cities, we would call those walled cities, uh, gated communities today, but he also went to villages. These were unwalled villages. We would call that like rural today. And Jesus had seven encounters by the time we get to Matthew 9.35 because he was pedestrian. He was always going from city to city or village to village, proximate to the people, proximate to their pain, and that's what he wants you and I to do as well. And I know you're doing that. I just heard about your September grand invitation, September the 8th. You'll be doing that as well. He went. Let me share a story with you that um, epitomizes this example. I was raised in cafes and bars. I wasn't raised in church until my uh, uh, pre-adolescent years. So in cafes and bars, that's, that's where we matriculated. My grandmother on my mother's side owned the cafe. My grandmother on my biological father's side owned the cafe. And my favorite great aunt also owned the cafe. So I matriculated. They call them cafes today. They were beer joints. That's what they were. They were juke joints. They were all kinds of things that happened in those places. But that's where I was raised. Um, and uh, one day, my stepfather moved us to another neighborhood. And when he moved us to another neighborhood, I'll never forget, it was on a Saturday morning, that two people came and they knocked on the door. It was Saturday morning, and uh, they greeted 
um, us and greeted him, sort of like a neighborhood uh, welcome wagon. And uh, then they asked him a question, is it all right if we come to have what they call mission on Monday night in your house? And uh, he didn't go to church, uh, but to be neighborly, he said yes. And so um, they came on Monday to have mission in our house. Now, he set us down on Sunday night and said some people are going to come and have what he called church in our house on Monday. I know you're not used to that, but you pay respect to him, and you better not go to sleep. If you go to sleep, I'm going to be on you like white on rice. That's what he said. And we didn't want him to be on us like that. And so these people came, about six or seven of them. They had a Bible, which I'd never seen. They had a hymn book that I'd never seen. They had a yellow book. That was where the mission Bible study lesson was in. I'd never seen that. And, of course, they were singing songs that I had never heard, prayed prayers. I'd never heard that either. Um, and the songs they sung were just incredibly slow. I mean, I, I was in the cafe. I helped the jukebox man change the records. And I was used to upbeat, fast, spin, I feel good, da -da -da -da, all, all of that. And they came in singing what they call hymns, which I'd never heard of. But I do remember this one. Um, Amen. Grace. I'm a, I'm a boy. I've never heard this. I'm saying, say the words already. Why are you dragging this out? How sweet the sound. And, I'm, and I remember he said, I'll be on you like white on rice. So I woke back up. That saved a wretch like me. It was the most boring that I had ever heard in my life. I couldn't believe it. And... Um, when they left, they said, can we uh, come back next Monday? And he said, yes. And they came back next Monday, a couple of Mondays after that. Then they invited us to church, Raw Terrace Missionary Baptist Church. Worship started at 7 a.m. Now, y'all started at what time? 10.30. The cafe opened at noon. By law, you couldn't open before noon. But worship started at 7 a.m., which means we had to get up at 5 a.m. to get dressed and go to church. And we did, and we were late. It was a long, wooden uh, European shotgun building with pews and so forth. We were late and new. And well, you know what they do when new people come to a Baptist church? They walk them right down the front and sit them where? In the front. And that's what we did. First time I'd ever darkened the doors of a church. And um, this is what struck me. I had never seen a group of people have joy without the benefit of alcohol. That was my observation as a preteen. I, I had never seen a group of people gather and have joy without the benefit of alcohol. But that, that's, that's what it was. And one lady, Verna Hubbard, said, uh, came after worship and said, young man, you must love preaching because you never took your eyes off the preacher. What she didn't know was I had never seen a preacher. And it was fascinating to me what he was talking about. I just couldn't take my eyes off of it. The whole experience was new. A few weeks later, unbeknownst to my parents, I was moved by the Spirit of God hearing the gospel, and I got up and I walked down the aisle to join the church, gave my 
hand to the preacher, my heart to God, as they would say. And they baptized me the same day in a pool of water, dirty water, cold. I don't know what was in that water. But they dunked me in that water, and that began my salvation journey. You know how it started? With a knock. Because V.L. Johnson and Virgie Clark went. They didn't wait for us to come. They went, proximate to people. So Jesus says, that's what I want you to do. He went. And not only did the text says he went, but it says when he went, he saw. He saw. He saw some things. It says he saw people dejected, distressed, hopeless, sheep without a shepherd. He saw some things. And when we go, we're going to see some things. And how are we going to view what we see? He saw people dejected, distressed, hopeless. And he saw them not as too hard, not as people who were hellions, but he saw them as a harvest. How do you see Charlotte? in our city, in Memphis, when we go, a lot of what we see is poverty. A lot of what we see is hopelessness. In the city of Memphis, 47% of our children under the age of 10 are in poverty. They qualify the federal poverty line. In our school district, 103,000 students, 93% who are people of color, mainly African-Americans. Two-thirds cannot read at grade level. Statistics tell us that if they cannot read at grade level by the beginning of the fourth grade, 75% will never catch up. So it consigns them to a life of chronic underemployment or underemployment and makes them especially vulnerable to crime. He saw dejection, distress, hopelessness. He went and he saw. What are the stats for Charlotte? I don't know. Are the stats where you came from? What are you saying? Let me give you a third one. So first he went, say he went, and then he, and then he stopped. He stopped. I don't know about you, but when I see stuff that I don't want to see, that's dejection, I tend to keep going. But he stopped to ponder it. He stopped. And if I'm honest with myself, God has to send crises in my life sometimes to interrupt my schedule because otherwise I keep going. But he sends these interruptions in order to get me to stop and focus not on myself or my family, but him and others. And when I don't do that voluntarily, every once in a while, He'll stop me so that I can stop. So Jesus, first he what? Went. And then he, and then he stopped. And then the text says he acted. He acted. He was moved with compassion. The Greek word from compassion is where we get our word spleen from. So deep in his inner self, he was moved with compassion. 
It's where we get our word mm, from. Jesus acted because he was mm, moved by their dejection, their distress. They didn't know God. They didn't know what was available to them. And he was mm, moved with distraction. Compassion. Compassion is sympathy plus action. That equals compassion. Sympathy plus action equals compassion. Sympathy plus inaction equals kindness. It's a nice way to do nothing. Now, if you're being honest with yourself, I may see some things, but I don't want to act. Or I may have sympathy and feel sorry for it. But if I don't pair it with action, it's not biblical compassion. So he went, he, and he, and then he, he acted. Sympathy plus action equals compassion. And then, fifthly, I'm almost finished. He did something else. He said, that was his perspective. He said, the harvest is hard. Is that what he said? No, wake up the person next to you. Did he say the harvest was hard? Did he say the harvest was too hard? Did he say the harvest was hopeless? Did he say these people are hellions, they deserve what they get? He said to his disciples, no, this is a harvest. They are ripe for the gospel. I'm so glad he did. He said, he wanted to change their perspective and said, fellas, this is a harvest. When we look out in our cities and what God has put around us, people who are up and out, people who are down and out, it's a harvest, he said. So I get back to my personal testimony. We went to church, got in church, really got involved. I was growing in my faith. And then all of a sudden, we stopped going to church, just cold turkey. I didn't even learn why until I was 17 years old. My parents didn't even tell me. But my father um, was on trial to be a deacon. And in order to be a deacon in the Baptist church, you couldn't drink. So he stopped drinking. Not only could you not drink, but you couldn't be around places that sold alcohol, which was a problem because his mother-in-law owned the cafe. So he could barely go see her, but he did. He did. He only went when it was very necessary. He stopped uh, in the cafe life and was ordained a deacon. One day, some other deacons took him fishing because they loved fishing. They had that in common. And when he opened the cooler, guess what he saw? Not soda water. Did somebody say it? Presbyterian, it's okay for Presbyterian to drink. I'm not in the Baptist church. <laughs> what, what, what did they see? Beer. Beer. And he was horrified. And he felt it was hypocritical. It crushed his spirit. And he stopped going to church. And we stopped going. I didn't find this out that I was 17. Hurt. And one day we were playing in the streets. We would play kids, maybe 15, 16. Uh, we played ditch to ditch. And um, as we were playing in the streets, cars would come down the street. And they would um, be trying to get from one place to another. And they too slow. we tell them to hurry up. And one day, this car was coming down the street, slower than normal. Uh, and it was just so slow. I, I don't know why it was so slow. But I got out in front, and I beckoned for the car to hurry up and get past us so we can go back to playing. But I didn't use my index finger. Some of you will get that on the way home. 
And I just said, keep covering. The car stopped right in front of me. Out of that car stood a former ex-Marine, 6'7", dressed in a three-piece suit. He got out of that black and yellow car. It was a Gremlin, 1970. You can Google it. Y'all don't know what that is, some of you. But he got out of that little car, stood up, looked right at me, and he said, Son, come here. I knew I was in trouble. He was going to go tell my parents. They were going to put the Board of Education to my seat of learning. It was just going to be bad. But he didn't do that. You know what he did? He said, uh, are these your friends? I said, yes, sir. He said, why are you playing in the streets? I said, well, we don't have anywhere else to play. He said, well, I got a field around the corner. We knew the church, but we wouldn't trespass. He said, I'll tell you what. You tell your friends if they come to choir rehearsal on Saturday night and church on Sunday morning. I'll put up basketball goals in the field. Y'all can get out the streets and just play in the field. You can play football, baseball, basketball, and uh, I'll have some snacks along the way. So I caucus with everybody. Sixteen of them were in choir rehearsal on sun- Saturday night and then church on Sunday morning. After about four or five weeks, about it was six or seven of us left. And then I got back entrenched into the church. It was not Reverend Othell Sharp who said, son, come here. It was God the Father through Reverend Sharp saying, son, come home. Amen. Watch this. Some of y'all don't believe that. I got a picture to show you. Do y'all see it? You see the tall guy with the shovel in his hand? That's Reverend Othell Sharp. Do you see? uh, Can y'all pick me out? I had a little hair back in those days. Um, But that man said about these teenage kids playing in the street, not in church, He didn't say they were too hard. He didn't say they were hellions. He said this is a harvest. And he invited us to the house of God. Changed my life. Y'all help me with this outline, then I'll go to my seat. Jesus and he And then he, and then he, and then he said, and then lastly, he sent. He sent us. He sent his disciples. He said, what you have seen me do, I want you to do as well. And if you don't have enough people to do it, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into his vineyard. That's what I want to close with, you city. You city, the field is ripe. First of all, be the answer to your own prayers. And second of all, if you do, God will send other harvesters into the field. For the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are too few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest, you've been doing that, and God has been blessing you for having people who can harvest and he'll keep on blessing you if you see your community is not too hard but a harvest. I love what Cynthia Clawson wrote. She says, there is peace and contentment in my father's house today. Lots of food on the table. No one is turned away. There is singing and laughter. The hours pass by, but a hush comes the scene as the father sadly cries, my house is full, but my fields are empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems my children all want to stay around my table. 
but no one wants to work in my field. Let's pray together. Gracious God, thank you for you, city, for planting them. I pray now that they would follow the model of Jesus as he went and then that you would send them. May they not be weary in well-doing, but in due time they will reap if they faint not. I lift up this congregation to you and all that makes them who they are, reflection of your wider city. And pray that you would send other laborers because you said the harvest is ripe. I know they will give your name the glory as they continue to do gospel good in this community for the sake of the kingdom and the glory of the high king of heaven we pray in fact we praise you for what you're doing and will do into and through them for your own name amen